Hello my loves and welcome to a new reading vlog. Hey Bubba. So I am going to be doing a probably a weekly reading a vlog. Um basically I'm just gonna start reading some of my books that I've got on my whatever phone TBR. So I am currently reading After We Fell by Gianna Darling. That is book four of the Fallen Men series. I'm reading that on my Kindle. Once I finish that I am gonna start with the inherent no, the inadequate air. Um, by Daniel L. Jensen, um, that's on my Kindle too, and then I will start reading some physical books. So I think I'm going to do the books that are the prompts for the team I'm on, which is Beach Readers. Um, so the two Kindle books are already for two of those prompts, and then I've got two um, physical books to read as well. <laughs> Sorry, Maisie is chewing her paw because she thinks she's very cute. Hang on. What doing? What doing, baby? Oh! What doing? Oh, what's this? <laughs> She's so adorable. But yeah, so that's the plan. I'm going to be reading the two Kindle books for definite. Then I will then start either Manus or Family of Liars. I think I'll probably do Family of Liars first because I'm really, really desperate to read that. And then, yeah, so I think I'm this week it's just going to be a couple of books, just getting into it because I have been a little bit delayed in the whole starting the books. I wanted to start a bit earlier, but I was still currently reading a book and I really wanted to finish it. I've actually decided to use that book. Um, for one of the prompts anyway, just to make it a bit easier. But yeah, so that's the plan. I am going to be reading After We Fell and The Inadequate Air, Family of Liars, and then probably Malice, and we'll go from there. So I hope you enjoy this vlog. There's going to be lots of probably puppy content involved as well. So, <laughs> and also it's very debatable on how much I get to read because I'm currently slightly obsessed with Maisie and just keep looking at her rather than reading so <laughs> this might be a really good vlog or it might be a vlog where there's very little reading but we will certainly see but with further ado let's get straight into the vlog let's get reading and I will update you when I've got some reading updates what's this is that your sloth Maisie is that your sloth is that your sloth is that your sloth Uh, what is it? What is it? What is it? Is it Maisie Sloth? Is it Maisie Sloth? Ah, you're gonna attack it. You attack it. You attack it. Uh, oh my word! Hello, my loves. Um. Let's be honest, I haven't done much reading because here's the thing, when you have a puppy, you get extremely distracted. When she sleeps, I read. When she's awake, I get distracted. Um, so that's sort of been my day. That's all I've been doing is reading when she's asleep, gets distracted when she's awake. Um, but I am reading After We Fell by Gianna Darling, which is book four in the Fallen Man series. Now, I am enjoying it, but I must admit, I'm not enjoying it as much as the other three books. And I think it's because... We are back with King and Cressida, which were the two characters in the first book. Now, I knew um, book four was going back to them, I think purely because, whereas the other sort of, um, like the other two books that I've just read, they sort of, they had like a happy ending. Cress and King sort of, it was a happy ending, but they're like, it was sort of, there was more, there, there was obviously more. So I'm not, I'm not hating it. Like it's still going to be a five star read because I love this series. But in regards to enjoyment and like how quickly I read these books, I'm not reading it quickly. And it isn't like I can put it to say that I'm getting distracted by Maisie. Partly I am getting distracted by Maisie, but it is more, I think because the problem with when you go back to characters, let me put you down so I'm a bit more comfortable. <laughs> Today. So the problem with going back with previous characters and going back in a sense where it's the same timeline as the previous book, it does feel like you've got a bit of repetition and that is sort of what is going on. So um, After We Fell is sort of happening the same time as book three. So book three was to do with HR and Lionel, who is the um, policeman. He's basically undercover with this like rival MC which is horrendous. HR sort of killed someone in that um MC gang. So she's sort of undercover with Lionel 2. 
Um, so it's like their romance, but obviously stuff that's going on there um, is what is going on here. So we've got King's perspective in After We Fell, and it's like him basically calling the shots of what's gone on in book three. So there are moments where it's a bit repetitive because of what's going on. And it also is quite difficult as well because we know what happened in book three. Like we know how it ended and everything. So in some sense, you sort of know how book four is going to play out. Like I know for well it's going to be a happy ending. I know for well that um, character wise no one dies and stuff like that. So it's sort of like I know what's happening. Like we have got like the in-between bit at the moment. Like we um, obviously are having King's perspective this side. Like um, in um, the first book it was more Cressida's perspective with King now and then um, this time around it's more King's perspective and we get Cressida now and then um, and I do like King's perspective because it's nice to um, see his emotions and stuff like that um, so what we are getting in this book is obviously King is now um, like a proper perspective in the Fallen Gang he is now like actually part of the Fallen Men um, he has also just proposed to Cressida, so they're now engaged. Cressida, which we did know in book three, but Cressida's um, opened up her own bookshop. Um, so sort of things that happen in book three, we're like actually getting more in depth in this book, um, which is lovely. And it is nice to have King's perspective, but I'm not loving it as much as the others because I'm sort of like, well, I already know what's happening. I know how it ends. I know what happens between Cress and King because obviously in book three, um, we know that they're married, we know that they've got kids and stuff like that. So it's sort of like, oh, now all these books can be read as a standalone and they can be read in different orders in some sense. Um, in hindsight, you reading them in the correct order is better purely because there are certain things in the books where like, you know, if you read book two, you would know that um, King and Crest are together and stuff like that. So it's, they are standalones, but in hindsight, it's probably better to read them in order because it all does sort of interlink. So this book, I am enjoying it. Like I've highlighted a lot of um, quotes, which I'll read out later on, like probably tomorrow. Like if I finish the book, I'll probably read out the quotes that I really liked. Like some of the quotes, especially like King's quotes, are just wonderful. They are just so wonderful and like so emotional. And I was just like, oh, this is just, I wish I had a man like him. But it is, I'm sort of like, I know how their story ends. I know what happens um, with this big like gang war because obviously we had it in book three. So it's sort of like, why is this book here? Like, why have we got this book? Because in hindsight, it is to me a repeat of a story, just someone else's perspective and more going into the actual how the Fallen did what they did. Whereas in like in book three, it was more lying on HR's perspective and their like um, participation in what went on. This time around, we're sort of getting the um, how the Fallen did their stuff and what they did and obviously I think there's like some like hidden stuff that's gone on it's just a bit like like I I do hope that as I get into the book there might be some plot twists there might be some different things that we didn't know happened in book three or anything like that that would be nice because then it would give me like okay I didn't know that that's a nice plot twist but what I'm getting at the moment I'm just like well I know how that ends I know yeah so like it's still going to be a five star purely because I love the characters I love the series as a whole and you know I can't help loving this series like I'm obsessed with the series like I am working my way through this whole um series because you know I, I need to know what goes on with all of these men and everything like that so like I in hindsight this is going to be a five star because of that but it is at the moment not my favorite um because I'm just like oh you know it, it's already been done I know how everything plays out it's just to me like a repet I think it's purely I think people are like they want to know whether like um Kres and King had like their proper happy ever after like everyone else we you know got married and got kids like we wanted to have that possibly whether it's just because people said like we didn't get that so she's done it that way I don't I don't really know um but yeah that's my thoughts I'm I'm not very far in I think I'm about 40% in or something like 30 40% in um but like it's sort of I'm reading it but I'm also like not really in the rush to keep reading keep reading turning the page down and like ignore the world because i'm sort of like well i know what happens i know what happens in this story so like it, and like you know is it, it's going to be a complete repeat or are we going to have some surprises i hope we do have some surprises um but we'll see so that is my update i'm now going to pop my pajamas on and i am going to catch up on watching silent witness because we've missed i think 
two episodes so I'm catching up with that and then I will probably do some reading a little bit more um probably when I go to bed once we've all gone to bed and Maisie's gone to bed um because at the moment like she you know I'm busy watching tv and I'm gonna probably be playing with her as well anyway yeah um so I probably will update you next time when I finish the book and um give my like final thoughts there but that's what I'm feeling at the minute um, not a bad thing, like I am enjoying it, just it's not my favourite book, especially if it's just going to be a repeat to book three, just a different perspective, so we'll see, um, but yeah, I'll catch up with you when I finish the book, and then we'll go on from there. breaking me. I think I've been stopping for like the last hour. <laughs> oh my god, how can I cry over a freaking book? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Honestly, I think Gianna Darling knows how to mess with your emotions. Like, I'm 79% in this book. Like, just, just like... <sighs> I can't deal with this. Like, they can't do this to me. They can't do this to me. <laughs> Good morning, my loves. So, I finished After Before by Gianna Darling, and my word, was it emotional? Like, you saw um, probably the last video of me blubbering my eyes out. I think for a good hour, maybe two, of this, like, last bit of this book. I was sobbing, like, I'm amazed that I was able to still read with the amount of crying I was doing. I did not expect it to be that heart-wrenching. Like, out of the four books I've read, I got teary-eyed, well, actually, no, I cried in Welcome to the Dark Side. Like, that was upsetting in many different ways. I had a little bit of a tear up in book three um, to do with um, H.R. and Lion. But this book is what actually made me sob uncontrollably for nearly two hours <laughs> and the thing is deep down like if I really actually sit and like deep down I I should have clicked that this wasn't what it was like you know I don't know what's going on here like it was very much a if I really actually let my brain actually do the thinking rather than my heart just like getting emotional things like I would have known that what happened wasn't actually real like it, it was like a a, a ploy to do stuff but regardless of deep down knowing that I was still a mess because at one point I honestly thought I was completely wrong and thought this person was dead like this is a five stars like t I'm taking back everything I said earlier like it I was getting uh, a bit like oh god this is gonna just be a repeat of book three but someone else's perspective and the first half in some sense it was but I kind of understand now why because we needed to understand um the next half of the book like to get there so basically in book three we do know that zeus got um arrested he got arrested for apparently killing a police officer and we all knew that this was a um this wasn't real like he, he wasn't anywhere where this police officer was but it was very clear that he had been framed and stuff now in the end of book three he was out of prison so it was sort of one of those things where i just assumed like they got him out then and there but actually no so in all of the books like you don't actually know the span of time of how long it is um so like in book three we knew he got arrested then it, they were and then the next sort of like epilogue it was lion's birthday and zeus was there out of prison and all of that so in like that sense you don't actually know how long it's been um so that's what that this book opened up with everything that went on in book three for us to know why Zeus got arrested because actually in this book it actually shows how long he was in prison for and how he got out of prison um, and this is why it was to do with King so basically we knew through more through um, book two and book three that um, there is a corrupt cop called um, well he's basically Staff Sergeant Dana which is Lion Danners whose character we know from most of the books who's obviously HR's um, partner um, but that's his dad and his dad's very corrupt he's pretty much will do anything to get the fallen mc out to the point that like he's in pocket with other mc um gangs and stuff like he is not a good cop like he is corrupt he will happily hurt civilians and people like that like you know um, and basically 
he's been out trying to get rid of the fallen gang he's been threatening all of the um women um children and stuff like that um so we knew this was going on in all the books like we knew like he's gonna be a major big issue and this is this book is what like we're following on this how they are basically trying to get rid of him so long story cut short um basically um the berserkers get um done for gun crime and trafficking and stuff like that um but um zeus gets arrested for apparently killing a particular cop now it turns out that this cop that was um, murdered was actually um, one of the cops who were um, helping the Fallen Gang to bring down Dana. So it was very clear that it was a cover-up, like Dana got someone to kill. Um, so basically, basically this cop got shot and it, the gun has Zeus's prints on and it's a gun of Zeus's as well. So he's obviously been arrested, he's in prison and basically they've got a very good lawyer who the majority of the time can get him out. But he said, I can't. He said, like, he's got a, um, a rap anyway, like he's been in prison before, so regardless of that he's killed before um second and he goes and says and there's evidence like that his fingerprints are on this gun it is his gun um so he was like you know there's so much i can do i can't get him out like the only way you can get him out is just to show that this was a plan this was you know all that so basically king ends up being the president like interim president while Zeus is there he has basically has like he wants to do this get dana down in like a different way to some of the others like everyone just wants to kill him but then they're like you'll just be you'll all be put in prison we won't be getting to do that so he ends up having this plan and basically this plan that he decides is that to get zeus out we have to prove that he will kill um so long story cut short he ends up getting married to Cress. dan is all there um dan ends up like crashing the wedding like which i expected and like basically king was like let's sort this out man anyway long story cut short King gets shot by Dana and boom. But in regards to that, everything came out that he was a corrupt cop, that he did all of his and all, all this stuff come out with Dana. Um and so like deep down I knew that this was what King wanted. Like King had made this all happen so like, you know, his death would free his father and also get Dana down to the fact that the um fallen gang will not have to be going through all this stuff with the police because they're all corrupt and in his pocket and all that. Um so for a while I was like, oh, this is just a point, like, you know, um, he'll come out. But, and as I was getting into the book, I thought, he's not, like, like everyone was grieving and, like, you know, there was a funeral and all that. It was, like, months later and I thought, no, he's actually dead. So, like, where I thought he wasn't, I then really believed that he was until then I started sobbing and all that. Turns out that I was right in the first place. It was that. So he basically had things set that it would be that he would pretend to die and that Dana would have murdered him and everything come to light. Like, he found a gun that actually... Um, was used to kill um this cop which belonged to dana it had dana's print so it obviously came clear that and like the bullet was actually the bullet to this gun so it like you know basically because it was corrupt they won in a sense like most people you would match the gun to the bullet um they didn't they just pretty much was like zeus has been in jail for killing someone before they just like yeah that's him they didn't really do proper police work to actually nail it on him properly um so yeah so basically king wasn't dead so basically king fell off a cliff but he had this bloke called Eugene who is part of the Fallen Gang, but no one knows he's part of the Fallen Gang, like, um, that. So basically Eugene caught him in the boat, um, King, like, got shot, but, like, in a sense that actually didn't get shot, like, it looked like he got, but it wasn't. Um, and basically he then went hiding until everything, you know, basically Zeus was out, everyone was pinned on Dana and stuff. Um, but obviously, like, he left breadcrumbs for Cress in her own way for her to come and find him. But obviously, Cress was so, um, messed up that she didn't notice it. It was only literally, she, she just found out she was pregnant. Um, she decided that she wanted to start getting herself back because she wasn't even, like, she, she wasn't suicidal or anything like that. She was very determined to keep living, but she wasn't living. Like, she was just a complete empty shell. Um, you know, she wasn't eating and things like that. So she was, like, she wanted to get away from all of these memories of King and, like, find herself, find herself for being a widow and someone after king and all of that um so she goes to visit where king died um and i think she went to drop she dropped something or something and then it clicked that actually and so she sort of had this theory she rung eugene and said oh i've I'm got myself in the water can you come help me and he goes yeah so he had a boat and it all came through so she ends up going to the place that she originally was going to go anyway because she knew that king was there they got reunited um so they had to stay there so i think she stayed there with him for eight months so she must have um so she was eight months and then everything was finally done to the pattern that um king could go 
back to back home to his family and all that obviously he had their children so it ended like in in a good way and so it makes sense because obviously in book three king's there with crest and king's there with crest with um their kids so like deep down i knew they weren't dead because like they had kids and all that but it was sort of like is this but with all the time frames of the books you never know how long it, it has been later because in this book it was four years of them first um being together um, so it was really good. Like we really did get King's perspective in this. It was more King's perspective and then Cress here and there. Um, and so yeah, that that's like that half and that like that was fantastic because it was like you understood everything more and made sense more about what happened in book three. But also, you know, I was heartbroken at this point because I genuinely thought King was gone. I thought, oh my god, like he is, he's gone. So like even though deep down I knew he wasn't, but then it like, felt so believable that like he was. That I start believing it. Like I hats off to Gianna Dani because she really does know how to make you really believe everything she's writing um but yeah there's so many quotes in this book that i highlighted but i do want to just mention um so basically after the fall I, in her acknowledgements i kind of wish she had this one bit at the front because basically she explained why she wanted to do um another book based on king and crest because every other book is just one book for these characters that's it but she said in book one she didn't want it to be complete full-on happily ever after because she didn't want she didn't like having that for Cress's character because obviously book one we were mainly following Cress and then a little bit of King. Um, she wanted it to be the sense that Cress actually became the woman that she was wanted to be, who she wanted to be, do the things she wanted and not be gone from one marriage and being shaped into what like her parents and what this bloke wanted her to be to then going to another relationship where she's shaped to be what that person wants her to be. She wanted her to have that self-discovery of deciding who she is. So that's why she ended it the way she did because she wanted to open up to do another book where Cress knows who she is um so that's the reason behind this book because she didn't want it to be the full happy ever after because she didn't feel that that was right for Cress's character especially with like going from one like shaped relationship she wanted to be by like her family and this bloke to then another one like she wanted her to be her own person so I wish that was before we read after we fought because I think after the fall sorry because I think I would have understood why we had this book um, but she did write in this like her thanks and everything which was right at the end and i have to read it out because it it really is the sort of concept behind this book in particular she goes in after the fall i wanted to explore not what it means to fall in love but what it means to stay in love with your chosen partner every single day it means sacrifice comp compromise passion and logic endurance and spontaneous spontaneity it means priority prioritizing your loved one and showing them how much you love them every moment you can because life is short and fragile I wanted to explore the little intimacies of life of an established couple that are so beautiful and, and, and so underappreciated in romance because we are usually all about the journey of getting to I love you instead of what it means to live those words every day after first saying them. Like, that is definitely the concept of this book and I felt that because Crest and King's love is so unique. It's so unlike all of the other um, couples in this book and I really appreciated that and what she wrote. I thought, no, that, that makes complete utter sense. Um just want to read out a few um quotes that i did like um so there's no end to my love for you it's woven into the very fabric of my soul so even when our bodies die we'll still never stop loving that was like uh and this is like a um conversation from crest to king she goes you're not your mother or your father king even if you don't believe you'll make good choices i do and i hope you know by now i've grown into the type of woman that wouldn't blink at this to you in prison if i had to that wouldn't ever turn her back on you just because we decided on a life of freedom and rebellion remember it was eve who made the decision to leave eden not adam that was really good and then there was another bit um so crest told her parents that she was engaged to King and basically her mum was like you're not no daughter of ours and all that don't ever speak to us again and King goes family isn't in the blood it's the echo of each name that sounds with the beat of your heart and I thought that is so true like you know I'm very close to my family I'm very lucky to have a family full of love and stuff like that but I also know that actually you know some people don't have that and their friends are their families and I, I agree with that like you know not all families have to be blood related like you know there are some blood related families that are awful um so I really understood that um, here's another bit. Happy ever after doesn't have to mean nothing ever goes wrong. This is from King. He argued, uh, he argued small fist clench. It means you love each other through everything, the good and the bad. He paused, hesitating, before looking at me. Just like what it mean, what it means to be family, right? I just thought, oh. Um, and then this is one bit. Um, King was talking to um, Staff Sergeant Dana, and he goes, "Goodness is, goodness is in action, not position." Which is what he said, Dana, because Dana was just like, "Oh, you're all corrupt, blah blah blah. You're wrong." He said, "I'm just doing this because you're all bad." And he goes and says, "But we're not. Like what we're doing." yeah okay what they're doing is illegal in a sense but actually what they're doing is goodness just not in a 
legal sense of things um and it's true because actually you look at the bike this fallen biker gang everyone says these are bad guys but then when you look at what dan has been doing and what dana has done and he's the supposed good guy you're like actually no he's the bad one they're not and the nasty he says i understood that there was nothing in death as fearsome as a thought of living without those you love because fear and love were two sides of the coin of every man's existence and the chance i was taking the choice i was making was love over fear which is what he said before he died uh, it's just uh, the quotes in here i felt were really 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 good um but yeah five stars absolutely love this book i'm really glad that it went a different direction after the first half like i kind of feel like if it continued on the direction i thought it was heading like i would have still given it five stars but it wouldn't be an enjoyment because i felt like it was a repeat of book three but i'm actually quite glad that it actually went off kilter and went to a different route but it made you understand a lot better what happened in book three so yeah five stars absolutely love that i am now off to go and read the inadequate air by daniel l jetson which is book three in the bridge kingdom series i think this is the last book of the series this follows um two different characters but characters that are still involved from books one and two um so um it'll be interesting to see how this um goes whether we see some of the old characters from book one and two or not um but i know it's enemies to lovers um it's also fantasy it's a bit political as well i think i'm very excited to start reading it so that's what i'm gonna go and do i'm gonna go and grab some lunch because it's now lunch time and then start reading so yeah we're doing well we are doing well much because i haven't really got much to uh tell you so yesterday i obviously told you that i finished after the fall i was starting the inadequate air by, um, by daniel l jensen so i did start reading it yesterday um i pretty much was just reading it when Maisie was asleep because when Maisie was awake it was playing with her getting her out in the toilet trying to get her to eat um but also along that i was also watching a lot of the celebrations for um the queen's jubilee because we missed out on a lot of them on the second of june because we went and picked up Maisie. also while alice was still here we were watching her boring stuff um so obviously we as a family missed out and some of the celebrations so we obviously wanted to watch that so we did and specifically last night i watched all of the like the um, little concert that was happening at buckingham palace so i haven't done much reading but i have done some reading and yeah so i'm currently reading the inadequate air i'm on chapter 23 i don't know what page i'm on but i'm on chapter 23 and i'm 23 percent in my kindle and i decided i'm going to give this a soft dnf i do want to finish this book it's obviously the last book in the bridge kingdom series so i do want to read it but at the moment, for this readathon and for the prompts that I wanted this book to be in, I can't because it reads so slow. So the first two books I read in one sitting, like I mean, I read the first book, finished it, already wanted to pick up the second book. I did and I finished it like, to be honest, I, I stayed up really late. So I finished it in hindsight, if you looked at it that day, but actually the time wise, it went into the following day. Um, so in hindsight, I pretty much finished a book in 20, uh, I finished two books in 24 hours, really. And it they were so good. They were so fast paced. I couldn't put the book down. I loved it. But The Inadequate Air is following two different characters and following the same story timeline that what happened in book two. So very, very similar to After the Fall in the sense that what's happening in that book is what happened in the previous book. Um, but we're just following different characters. Now, admittedly, compared to After the Fall, this one isn't feeling repetitive like, at all. Like we sort of know little bits that's going on um that's obviously we know from book two but there's the storyline and plot is very different that it's not repetitive but it is happening in what happened in book two but we're following two different characters of which we do know of they were mentioned and we saw quite a bit of them in book two so we follow Karis, which is the prince to king um silas which is lara's half brother and we follow zahara who is the general to the empress who is also technically in line to be the empress should the empress die even though she's only the empress's niece um, um basically long story cut short she's got her own agenda where she wants to kill the king she wants to kill the king and the prince says princes and anyone with the 
Velion name because basically King Silas murdered her mother, she beheaded her and then tied um, Zahara to this post holding her mum's head while her mum's body was, yeah, not nice. Um, so she's obviously got an agenda that she wants to kill all of them, blah blah blah. Um, whereas Karis, Prince Karis, he basically, he doesn't want anything to do with the war, he doesn't like the war, he doesn't like the fact that his father will kill absolutely anyone, like he doesn't care about civilians being killed and stuff like that, and he, he wants to change it, but he also knows he can't because pretty much he knows for well his father's going to kill him because his father pretty much wants to be the king, no one else. Uh, um, so basically we're following them um, and all of this, so literally, I have literally read 23 chapters and the previous chapter, um, so chapter 10, 23, they finally met and they finally agreed to help each other out to sort of not stop the war per se, but to stop the war in the sense that all the civilians are getting attacked because it is the civilians who want nothing to do with it other than ones getting hurt rather than the um, actual um, soldiers and stuff like that. So I literally read 23 chapters and I finally got to that and I'm just like, ugh. I'm also a little bit confused because Zahara knows pretty much that the all of the children of King Silas has these amazing blue eyes and she's just met Karis and she hasn't clocked that he is the prince and I don't know what it doesn't actually say whether he's um looks completely different or what but the way I'm reading it is like he hasn't and so I'm like how is she not clicked by his color of his eyes that he's the prince like considering she knows what to look for she's clueless so yeah and it's, it's just it's really so slow and because it is it's new characters it's a new sort of story but not like it's still the same world it's still to do and it's still in the same times of what happened in book two it's just different people's point of view and what they did in that particular moment because we mainly followed Erez and Lara in the first two books um but it's reading like it's the first book in a series it's just like really descriptive really world building very very slow and I'm just like as much as I do want to finish the series I don't want to read it now it's gonna it's a, over, just under 600 pages so it's a longer book compared to the previous two and I'm thinking for a reader form I want to read a book that I can read quite quickly um not a book that's going to take me ages because it's reading like a new book in a series even though it's the last book in a series um and i'm just i'm not vibing with that at the moment it's not giving me the whole i want to pick this up and read and read and read like the other two books like this i can feel already it's going to take me a long time just to read because it's so slow whereas in the other two books it was very fast space very quick to the point even though they were like you know new books in the series it was so quick and i really enjoyed it so i give it decided to give it a soft dnf and not use this book for any of the prompts that i am going to pick up Messy Roots by um, Laura Gao, or Gao, and this is a graphic memoir of a Rouhanese American. So this is an arc, um, however, I think it's already out. I think the actual finished um, like arc looks, it's in colour, but the arc I've got is a little bit in colour and then it's all black and white. But I'm going to read this because as you can see, there are water on the cover there, and there's water on the cover there. So this fits with the proper water on the cover, which is what the Anadra kit air was for. I'm also going to use this for a different format, like I had, that like I previously was using for the Inadequate Air because it's a graphic novel, it is a complete different format to what I usually read. I'm also going to use this for under 300 pages because it's 266 pages. But on top of that, this also gives me extra bonus points for it being an LGBTQI plus rep. And also, this also gives me the diverse bonus points as well because it's also um, a diverse book about being... Um, being both um, Chinese and American and I also think this is going to also talk a bit about race and stuff like that so I feel like this book's also going to fit the diverse rep bonus points so in hindsight this book actually is going to give me more points than what I would have done with the inadequate air so that's even better so we're going to be reading this next it's not going to take me long because it's short and it's a graphic novel and then once I finish this which I'll probably do today I will unpick up the family of lies <laughs> So I didn't really vlog much yesterday, apologies. My grandparents were around too, so I didn't do much reading. I actually, I managed to read half of this, well, I, no, I read a third of it before my grandparents came around, um, and then I read the remaining bit more in the evening once Alice was in bed. Um, so I have finished Messy Roots by Laura Gow, and I really, really, really loved this. I gave it five stars. Um, I, I love, like, I, obviously I've got an arc, but this is what the like colour, it's all going to be colour and it's all this sort of colours as well. It's like yellows and reds. It's like 
um, that sort of colours. But I've I've seen people's reviews and obviously they've done some little videos, and I just love the like the actual colour and illustrations of this. Um, but actually learning about Laura's life, like in some sense, like, like it says a graphic memoir, but I kind of feel like, like this is just a diary, but like a diary of her as like a teenager and everything. But it does. It focuses. It says on here, but it focuses on. Um, basically like it, it, it like, it's a very honest and it touches on topics such as immigration racism sexuality and assimilation um it's like um it's, it's basically one of those books where it's like oof. like there's certain things that i just it's made me think like for example there was quite a big bit about her name so her name is i think young yang or young yang or young yang i can't remember now like her actual name um, like her birth name she wanted to change because no one could pronounce it and it was just easier to, like she wouldn't let teachers attempt it she just said I'm here and all that and she decided she wanted to change her name and she wanted to change it to Laura and it was like a bit like that like she felt embarrassed of a name because no one could pronounce it hence why she did like an easier name and she also felt like having a name like Laura gives her like like makes her feel like she's American sort of thing and it made me really think because I was like well actually you know there are some names that I can't pronounce and I attempt it and I apologise if I haven't done it right. But actually, isn't that just as offensive of not being able to say it at all because I'm apologising but I'm not learning from it? Like in hindsight, actually, should I just look up how to pronounce the name if I need help and do it like that? Because, you know, at least I'm doing something and learning something rather than just going, oh, I'm so sorry if I messed that up. So it made me even think about like what I've been doing and stuff. And it is a habit like, I'm, like I have done. So it's sort of only something now that I'm like really thinking about and like want to change in myself. But also there was bits like there was a specific bit like she was too. Um, so she was too. Um, hang on, let me double check. So there was like, right, so, so basically at that one moment, like she was too Chinese to be American. And then when she went back to her hometown and stuff like that, she was too American. Like it, it got to the point that like she wasn't accepted in any way. Like in America, in American schools, like she wasn't um, like specifically, she's very clever with maths purely because of that very much just put it in her but she was really good at maths and then everyone was in like this school like the american school was like oh um she's chinese she will be good at it um so she then went to do basketball because like it was more of an american thing and she was good at it and all of that um but then like you know it's it's too american so it's like she was like damned if she does damned if she do like whatever she did it wasn't acceptable like she was too american to be chinese too chinese to be american it was just it was really interesting and it was really interesting on like seeing her grow and actually deciding like it, it ended up being she embraced who she was which was she is Chinese American she is both um like she got to a point where she was happy with herself and on top of all of that she also was like you know is she gay because obviously she was getting more feelings out of women than um men so obviously that's going on as well like you know she's Chinese American she doesn't know where she stands in that and then to be having feelings for um the same sex and all of that like it was really interesting a really interesting journey i don't actually know how old she, um laura is now in regards to like from like here like obviously this was like her teenage years so i'm, I'm guessing she's uh, she's an adult but i don't think she's i don't know i would have thought she was like in her 20s something I, I don't know that doesn't actually have an author by in here um no but it was just it was really good it made me really 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 think things there is like a whole big thing here like a letter she did and it's a, like she explains why she did this um graphic novel and i would read it out but it was quite long but it's so just even that was just so good and so like made you like really think um so yeah five stars absolutely love that and also this gives me really extra points because it's got um lgbtqi plus um bonus points but also with it being diverse i've got diverse bonus points in that so i got more points in reading that book which is brilliant and i did want to at least read one queer book um purely because it's pride i have got a few others anyway but i just wanted to make sure i did so i'm glad i did so i've read that and now i'm on to family of liars by e lockhart which is like the newest release of her like books from like we were liars so we were liars is that but this is like classed as the like as a prequel however 
I don't really know whether it like it's a prequel, but I sort of like is it a prequel because it does say here. Um, is it right here? Yes, yeah, so it says right here, which is from the author of Sus. Dear readers, this book contains spoilers for the novel We Were Liars. I love you and I wrote this for you with ambition and black copies. So basically, if you haven't read We Were Liars, you need to read that first. So I kind of feel like it's a prequel in the sense that we're following the adults and probably like why um, they've been lying and been secretive and like the reasons why they've had a falling out and all that, which got to why these children started a fire off and everything went to put um because like literally because i've already sort of had a little thing like the first book is my son is dead and it's so like it is an instant thing like you need to read that book to understand why and what happened i'm really excited to read this like i see this as being a five-star prediction i hope it is because we were liars was amazing like i read it and you know it it was one of those books where i was like oh it's good like it wasn't a five star and then i got to this pivotal moment i thought what like i did not realize the narrator was this and that this happened and that all of these things that would be mentioned was actually what didn't happen it was like ghosts and sort of thing and it was like it was such a big twist that I was like ah oh, did not expect it and that boosted it up in five stars because even now and I read this last year I still can't forget that book it's one of those books that has stayed with me just because I did not expect it to be what it was like and how it and I was just like oh um, so yeah, I really hope this lives up to my expectations that I've got. Like, I really hope it is five stars and I love it just as much as the first book. But yeah, so I'm going to start reading that. Good morning, my loves. I wanted to pop on while Maisie is having a puppy nap and talk to you about Family of Liars by E. Lockhart. So I am halfway, just over halfway actually, I'm on chapter 44, page 167. And I think I am on part five, which is like Mr. Fox. Um, I'm really enjoying this book. But it's it's not given me the same vibes as We Were Liars. However, with We Were Liars, when I first read it, like the first, like apart from the last third of the book, it was mediocre. Like it was gripping in the sense that I wanted to continue reading and everything like that. Like I couldn't put the book down, but there wasn't anything like wow going on until the last third of the book where this massive twist happened and then all of this stuff came out and it was like, oh my God, I was not expecting that. Um, so I'm kind of holding out on hope that this is what this book's going to do. It's going to give me such a big twist near the end that just trumps everything else. However, I'm kind of feeling like that might not happen because I do have an inkling. I may be wrong, but I do have an inkling where this is going to go. Just purely because of how we were liars, how that went. I kind of feel like it's how how that went in particular. I kind of get in the same sense in here. And I'm like, oh, OK, like if I'm right, if the person I think is the one who's going to get um, get killed, then it's not going to really give me the five star vibe. Like at the moment, I'm I'm sort of at the four star vibe. I think it's going to be a four star read rather than five stars. Four stars are still good unless like it, something really twisty does happen that I did not expect. And it's like an oh, my God, sort of moment. But explaining what family of liars is about, I need to explain a little bit about We Were Liars. So if you haven't read We Were, we Were Liars and you want to, don't watch this. If you are currently reading it, don't watch this. If you do not care, do what you want. Um, but basically, in We Were Liars, we're following like a group of teenagers. Um, and I can't fully remember. I think one of the teenagers is a Sinclair. So I think it's her and her siblings. And I think it most possibly was her cousin. Um, and then people came like along sort of like what these dads are I think it, it was last year so I can't remember fully the whole dynamic all I remember is these teenagers their parents are not exactly friends anymore they're like not very lovey-dovey they sort of when there's like family sort of things together it's very tense um like their parents sort of have arguments where the ch they think the children can't hear and stuff like that and it never used to be like that and the children don't understand why this is like why they're like this and so they wanted to get down at the bottom of it and bring like their families back together because obviously um you know spending summer on this island when it's just them and everything's a bit ugh. so they decide to basically set fire to something i can't remember what it was i think it was one of the houses or something um however just like to get attention get the families brought together and like sort of bring them all to get back to back together i think that was how it was but it it went into a disaster and basically only one person lived 
take that as you will and basically the person who lived like she was like explaining her summer and all of that um but it turned out like her summer she was actually just playing with her friends who were ghosts she she didn't i think she sort of had ptsd where she forgot what happened um that she didn't really like she thought they were her friends and all that but like her family didn't like see and all that they were really sad and it turned out that she was playing with her friends who were ghosts and along the way she finally remembered what happened it was it was sort of that was the twist and it was very good um but in so that's sort of where this book is and how this book takes place is the mother in this book is talking to her dead son johnny who is a ghost now interesting thing is there were ghosts, ghosts involved in we were liars there's ghosts involved in this so i it, i kind of feel like the sinclair family are people who sort of can see it like in that sense um but i'm trying to <laughs> the next door neighbor at the back of me he's currently outside and he's tearing and i'm there thinking i'm looking right at the camera on the um in the window anyway he's gone um so basically the starting opening of family of lies is we're following um she's called carrie but is she caroline yeah caroline um so we're following caroline or carrie and basically she's talking to her dead son johnny who was one of the children who died and we were lies and um basically he's just like there and he asked all these things so she decides to come find him so then we're now going back to her years of teenagers at this island in massachusetts um and she's basically telling him about all the lies and secrets and the reason behind why the families in we were liars were so tense so that's sort of what's going on so it is just opening up a sort of um meeting carrie and her siblings so she, basically carrie um is the daughter of harris sinclair and tipper taff sinclair so harris sinclair and Dean Sinclair, which is her uncle, um, they both obviously um, bought the island, they did all of the island up, but Dean messed up, so basically Harris is like the sole owner and all that, um, so he's got a lot of money, you can, uh, they're, they're, they're rich, but their money isn't um, just good money, it's sort of there is dirty money involved there, Tipper obviously married into the family, but she is very, you know, she's got money behind her too, um, so Harris and Tipper, they've got their, um, so they're, they're like house, so there's like the houses names. So we've got Claremont House, we've got Pembenzie House and Goose Cottage. So Claremont House is Sinclair's. So they go there for their summer holidays. The rest of the time they live in Boston. Dean Sinclair is the one who has the Pembenzie um, house and lives in Philadelphia. And then Goose Cottage is like for guests um, and stuff like that. So basically, Carrie, it's Carrie and her three other sisters so there's Carrie who is the oldest and there's Penelope or Penny who is the second oldest um Elizabeth or Bez she's um, the middle child and then we have Rosemary um so we obviously meet all of them um they're all spending like they're like not teenagers so they're like sort of young children at the first um like summer holiday like we sort of see um but Rosemary age 10 tragically has an accident and dies so basically um she the rest of the sisters i don't know where they all went kind of thing i think they all went out but um rosemary stayed with the nanny and she was out in the um water because they've like obviously got like beach sort of thing there she was out in the water she's a very strong confident swimmer however the weather started taking a turn and it was getting very cold so the nanny went back into the house to go and get some jumpers for them um but while she did that the weather really turned to the sense that the water got really choppy it made um rosemary go out further than she is used to and she was struggling and basically she drowned um, but Nanny, by the time she got her, she didn't know CPR either, which is already a red flag in my opinion. And unfortunately, she died. Um, and so she was ten, I think. Um, I think the sister, I think Carrie was about fifteen, fifteen, sixteen, maybe. Um, but basically, they've gone back the, the next year, where she is like sixteen, seventeen for their summer. But basically, the whole family has pretty much like doesn't talk about Rosemary, doesn't really show any grief for Rosemary. Rosemary's room is completely like. It doesn't look like Rosemary's room anymore and stuff like that. And basically, Carrie's really struggling. Like, she's grieving. She misses her younger sister. But, like, the whole Sinclair family is very much, you can't talk. There's, like, all these rules and stuff like that. And so she obviously is grieving with her sister. On top of that, her family's telling her to have this jaw surgery because apparently it's messing up with her eating. Um, but there is a reason behind it, which I'll get to in a minute. But basically, she ends up having jaw surgery, like, a couple months after her, daughter, uh, her sister's death. And... Um, it goes okay but then she gets an infection and because she does there's like a motto saying don't um it was not important don't bother so she didn't bother telling her parents that she was actually she thinks she had an infection obviously she ended up telling them she went to doctors turned out it was severely bad to the point that she had antibiotics for weeks 
and she had to have another surgery anyway so she has this jaw surgery um basically because her family are telling her that she isn't a Claire because she hasn't got the perfect jaw line like they've got blah 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 um she from then on is addicted to pills she, she's addicted to codeine which gives her like a fluffy head she's also found her father's sleeping pills so she's still on stand, so she uses them um so she um is addicted to pills and we've already got to the point where as an adult she is is she has a problem she goes to rehab twice and stuff like that and now she's no longer like on drugs and like uh, um, relies on them but she drinks a lot more to take up the thing so it's sort of like one addiction's gone but maybe another one's starting anyway um basically she's like it's her summer holiday she's grieving she wants to like talk about her sister but no one will um and then her cousin comes along with her boyfriend and her boyfriend's friends which are these, these boys and so obviously they start having like this like a better summer she sort of wants to enjoy them their boys and obviously and like you know sort of enjoy summer because she's getting quite low because no one's talking about her sister um but we've just had a plot twist so there is this like picture in her mother's jewelry box and there's a face scratched out and um carrie saw it and was wondering what it is and in the end like a few like weeks after seeing that she talks to her mum and tells her mum look what is what is it like and so her mum finally tells her it turns out the person in the photo that it scratched face her father did it turns out that her father isn't actually her biological father the person in that photo is her bi biological father um that basically her mum her mum was in love with this guy but because he was jewish and because he was very religious her parents wouldn't let her be with him or even like think about having get married having a family because they weren't into having religious people in the family like they're obviously very rich they have all these like yeah like you have to be in a spe specific like college like harvard and stuff like that yeah it's a very you can imagine what this kind of family is like um so basically she starts seeing harris you know she quite likes him but obviously like you know she's not fully in love with him and all that but like her family are quite happy with him because he's made of money and stuff like that and he's like obviously got this proper education and stuff so anyway he proposes to her and she obviously says yes they get married but she does still have an affair with this thing and she found, finds out she's pregnant um and obviously it's not harris's baby because the timing was wrong because he was away for three weeks for work long story cut short she finds out she's pregnant she finds out like actually this other bloke's thing she tells harris he says like she doesn't want any lies so they stick together and he says like you know i'm i don't want him involved i don't want him on the like, to know or anything like that um i want to be the father so that's what happens so obviously carrie's just found out that her dad isn't really her dad that she isn't actually a proper sinclair sort of thing um she now realizes why she had to have this jaw surgery because the jaw reminded um harris of them like her father um because it was the same jaw and that's why she had surgery she wasn't at all like an overbite or because um she wasn't eating properly like she was made to believe it purely was because her jaw was a fa her real father's jaw and she didn't look like a sinclair in that sense and father didn't like it so yeah so she just found out that so she is now like completely drug tired of things she can see her sister rosemary's ghost um, so it's obviously like Rosemary's there to help Carrie. So Carrie is sort of now starting to date this one of these boys called Feth. Um, and I think he's the one that's going to die. Because it's how we were lies where they really focused on a specific two characters more than the others. And obviously these two characters were what went behind this whole set and something alike. So because there's a lot going on about Feth, I kind of feel like he's going to be the one who dies. But I'm curious to see why. And if I am right, then I can now understand why the siblings, like the adult siblings that like we meet and we realise why they were all tense and not very close anymore. Because obviously they must have covered up this death, kept it a secret. And obviously holding secrets like that is going to um, mess things up. So that's what's going on. That's my sort of prediction. If I'm right in my prediction, and I don't think, unless it's like a complete like, oh my God moment, I don't think it's going to be five stars. But I kind of have got an inkling. I might be right just by the way it's going but i am enjoying it like i'm very much like it's very much you cannot stand this family and i kind of can understand why carrie in we were liars why the children struggled with her because she is in some sense very much copying what her parents were like and obviously she's got problems with being um you know addiction to pills and obviously she doesn't take them anymore but obviously she drunk a lot um so it is interesting to actually understand the parents from we were liars and why all this is going on um it is very clear in some sense that these family in, in like these like sinclair families and other families like they're not abusive in the sense that they're physical but i certainly think there is emotional abuse going on um just by like that there's a lot of control and manipulation going on like i you know it, it kind of makes you think like money is not everything and this family has a lot of money but they are clearly 
not overly nice. Um, there is something fishy about Rosemary's death. The fact that this nanny didn't know CPR, I'm kind of like, I'm sorry, but surely if you've got a nanny, they need to know first aid, they need to know CPR and stuff like that because they're looking after your children, especially if you're not there. So I'm kind of wondering whether something happened and like the parents have done a cover up and that's why they're not talking about Rosemary because um, they can't. Um, like that would be an interesting twist. Um, if that's right, then I've spoiled <laughs> like, I never, Yeah, like I am enjoying it. Um, at the moment, I'm not getting the same vibe as I was getting with We Were Liars, but then I do remember with We Were Liars, I felt like this as well, reading it. Like it wasn't, it was a good read, but it wasn't like an, oh my God, this is fantastic, like five star read until we got to this specific massive twist and big reveal and ending that I was like, what? And like, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So, you know, it, at the moment it is giving that vibe of We Were Liars in the sense that nothing's, you know, it's good, but nothing's like really wowing me. But how she has been writing in We Were Liars, I'm kind of wondering whether it's going to like all kick off in like the first third. We will see. Hello, my loves. So I have officially finished Family of Liars by E. Lockhart. And I'm going to give my little mini review and then a wrap up and then I'm ending this vlog because I'm going to go and start a new one since it's been like a week, give or take. Um, So I predicted this right. Um, The boy, Fef. Oh my God, have I, I keep questioning have I said it yeah the boy Feth was the one that got killed um spoilers if you haven't read this and you're going to don't watch this bit um if you don't care then carry on but here's your warning because I'm going to spoil it so basically Feth gets killed but he gets killed so here's the thing we find out what happens to him he gets killed and so it was all that and I thought right okay in hindsight I kind of can understand why he was killed because basically he was forcing himself on one of the sisters um like it's that sort of question of would he have still done stuff or would he have finally listened to the no or you know would it have been um instead of a near rape a full-on rape um we never know um so we kind of thought that and like obviously the sisters covered it up because they they knew deep down like everything would go to pot so they covered it up and blah 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 um obviously we, it all gets wrapped up good but then we actually find out um well, we find out two, two things. So we find out that the father was awake and saw saw sort of what happened, not fully, but he put two and two and together and so he protected the girls because he managed to find this missing plank of wood, which was the thing that murdered Feth. And so he covered it and yeah. Um, so we had that and I was like, oh, okay. And then we had the actual real reveal, which was that actually um, our main character, Carrie, killed Feth, but she didn't kill him in a way we thought. So basically she she heard um penny say no feff and all of that um but she was so fuming that she literally just went and hit feff um she was fuming and angry with him and she she sort of was there thinking would she have killed her sister too like she was so angry but then I, it was the fact that um penny um because basically feff and penny had a an affair sort of yeah um but penny then turned on and said you saved me you saved me so it turned out that feth was actually trying it on trying to forcefully have sex with her she kept saying no he wasn't taking over an answer and obviously carrie intervened so everyone believed that she like protected penny but carrie knows actually that it was just pure blunt rage she was fed up of like everyone always loving penny even though she's not a nice person and all that and she said if it wasn't the look on penny's face and what she said she wasn't sure whether she would have hurt penny too um so we have that. So I'm giving this four stars purely because I knew it was going to be something. I kind of, I kind of can understand everything. I can understand the scenario and why the adults are the way they are. And I don't feel bad for Beth because I, I honestly think he's going to be the guy who would have been in prison. He probably would have been a rapist because it was all he cared about was himself. He didn't care about anyone else. He pretty much did anything he wanted, like, you know, he, it was very clear that I kind of feel like if Carrie didn't get in the way, I think it wouldn't have been like a near rape. Um, it, it, it is one of those ones where it makes you understand the parents in We Were Liars and why the teenagers did what they did. Like, I can understand that. I do feel sorry for Carrie and everything that's gone on, but it wasn't as good as We Were Liars. Like, you know, I, I instantly sort of, as I got a third into this book, kind of clicked that it possibly was going to be theft. Obviously didn't know the reason behind it, um, but still. And I sort of had an inkling that, you know, it was going to be a cover-up and stuff like that um it was nice to for her to be able to see her son and to talk to her son and all that and it's also nice to sort of see her move on and everything like that 
um but it just it wasn't like we were liars like we were liars i did not expect any of the twists and like the whole thing of everything that we thought was happening actually didn't happen like she was actually doing this with ghosts and no one like she, you know she was just playing with, on her own and stuff like that and we were liars so with i just i i love that like i it's a book that still stays with me this one like it's nice to understand the parents from we were liars and why they were like where they were and like the sort of secrets and stuff um but it just wasn't as good so i've given this four stars um obviously i read messy reeks which is a graphic novel i've given this five stars because i thought it was really good representation of everything and i really like the illustrations as well and then lastly i read after the fall which i did end up giving five stars because once the initial first half of the whole like sort of repeat of book three the remaining half of it was like answering some of the things that we didn't understand in book three and then yeah as you probably saw so yeah thank you for watching this vlog let me know if you read any of these books and what your thoughts are if you you know have and yes thank you for watching and i'll see you again in the next video bye